All right, Kathy asks, I have the whey and cocoa powder and other items that are not necessarily clean. Is it okay to use those until I get products in the same store? Yes, Kathy, so that's a great question. So I will just, for what it's worth, just so folks, <laughs> to give you a little bit of context, there's, a quite, there's quite a few people that are not actually able to make some of the live calls. So because of that, however, I wanna make sure these are super valuable for them. So those, that's why sometimes we have to give, uh, I wanna make sure I get to some of the questions that were written in, because for folks that can't make the calls, they can still write in their questions and then see the session recording afterwards. However, I love the interaction. So I'm gonna balance that, but uh, Kathy, you asked the, yes. So if you have things like whey and cocoa powder, other items that aren't necessarily clean, is it okay to use those or, or do you need to, are they gonna destroy your efforts? So this is a very great specific question with an awesome specific answer and then also general learnings we can take away from it. So uh, the, the short answer is unless, unless it's just complete garbage, which I don't think it is. Like if, it's, uh, if it was Nestle Quick, for example, which isn't really cocoa powder. So it's probably something maybe like a Hershey's cocoa powder that you might have. You know, if it was a Nestle, Nestle Quick, I'd say throw that away because it's not even cocoa powder, that's just sugar. Um, but if it's it's general, just general store bought stuff, which is going to be reasonably saying, hey, that's not going to that's not going to just completely ruin your efforts. And I want to make a quick general point here, which is, I, I would really encourage everybody, and this is this is really really important to think of your metabolic system a little bit like your immune system. Now, what do I mean by that? So the way your immune system works is uh, not that. So your immune system is resilient, right? Like if you get a cold or if you get exposed to a virus or bacteria, your immune system, if your immune system itself is healthy, will, will bring you back, right? That's the job of your immune system. And that's why diseases such as HIV or AIDS are so terrifying because they attack your immune system itself. So why am I saying this? Well, so for example, if we were to say, hey, is it okay to ever have any viruses or any bacteria enter your immune system? Uh, absolutely. I mean, that's that's what your immune system is for. Life, we can never be perfect. We can never uh, completely avoid sort of any of those disease causing agents, but we have to make sure we have a strong immune system so that if we do get exposed to something which is less than ideal, we can come back from it. That's the same thing. That's the same mindset we want to have when it comes to our metabolism, right? So your metabolism, we talk about the set point. We talk about it's an established system and we talk about how when your set point is elevated or when your sink is clogged your body is essentially fighting to keep you heavy so you can think of having a compromised metabolism like having a compromised immune system so when someone's immune system is compromised right even like the slightest little thing can cause life-threatening problems but when you have a strong immune system, if you, if, if you get a little bit of, of virus or bacteria, hey, you know, you bounce back in a week, you bounce back in two weeks. You wanna make sure you don't intentionally expose yourself. Like you don't want anyone coughing in your face, <laughs> but, but you're not worried if just a little bit gets in there. The same thing applies to your metabolism. Once we heal it from the inside, once we make sure you have a, a, a safe and strong metabolism, a little bit of exposure to things that aren't perfect for lack of better terms, is, is really just gonna be like water off a duck's back. And a good example of this is actually children. So sometimes we think, unfortunately, and our society tells us that, hey, the, you know, kids, if you look at a children's menu, right, it's so sad and it's heartbreaking because it's essentially a litany of insanity. In some ways, the definition of children's food is <laughs> that which is packed with processed nonsense, uh, fats and sugar and salt, I mean, a children's menu or children's cereal, if you think about it, those are the least sane items in the world. And we're told uh, by big food that that's okay. I mean, they're kids, their bodies can handle it. And, and that's, that's really, that's not at all true. I mean, it does the same level of damage, if not more damage to children than it does to adults. But one of the reasons we don't see it doing as much damage as immediately to children is a child's metabolism, right, is fresh. It hasn't gone through cycles of yo-yo dieting. It hasn't been exposed to a toxic food environment for 40, 50, 60 years. So if, if a child gets exposed to consistent low doses of insane foods, it's gonna have potentially less of a visible or immediate impact on them than it would an adult, not because it's any less bad for them, but just because you know their immune system their metabolic immune system hasn't been, let's say, you know, beaten down as long. Now, unfortunately, that's, of course, 
we're seeing nowadays that that's not necessarily true in the sense that even though a child's metabolism is fresh, you know, it's fresh, the toxic stuff that's being put into their bodies by schools and by food manufacturers is overwhelming them. But the macro point here, Kathy, to answer your question is, if you think about, for example, maybe some whey and some cocoa powder that you got from your grocery store, from GNC or something like that, as being, you know, just not completely toxic, but something that is suboptimally sane, if you're working to heal your metabolism, you know, that's just gonna be like just a little bit of like a cold bug getting into your immune system. And as long as we heal the system itself, it's gonna roll right off. So is it great? No, is it is it is it going to really help you? No. Is it gonna completely derail your efforts? No. And and please, another uh good thing to keep in mind is there is really nothing you can do in one day and that man this is a really important point actually there is nothing you can do in one day that is going to completely derail your efforts and i, I think that's actually really important maybe even write that down like even on your worst day or our most insane day nothing you did that day ruins everything right that your your health doesn't work that way so um by way of analogy right like it's it's really easy to 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 lose all of your money in one day right if you look at the financial meltdown that happens a little while a lot of people lost all of their investment or all of their 401k or all of their re retirement in one day now when it comes to our fat metabolism system when it comes to neurological inflammation when it talks comes to our hormones and our gut there is nothing that we can do in one day that just completely destroys that. That's not how that biological system works. It's not either or. So we've got to always remember to be kind to ourselves, right? Like I, it, something happens, you go to a party, you go a little insane, look, it happened, you learn from it, you're gonna do your best to not let it happen again. But the the worst thing is, it, is not actually, <sighs> being insane in that moment. The worst thing would be to let that isolated event contaminate your lowercase sanity, right? Like it happened. Like if you're an athlete, you had a bad game. It's cool. You know what? You know what the most important thing is? That we learn from it and we move on. So whether it's store-bought whey, store-bought cocoa powder, whether it's a, a meal out with friends, or whether it's really anything in life in general, I would I would urge you to give yourself permission to learn from that event, to make a commitment that it will never happen again, or you will do everything in your power not to let it happen again, but to never let shame or guilt contaminate you. Because that's, hey, more than anything you're gonna find in processed foods, more than anything you're gonna find in that whey or that cocoa powder you bought from the store, Kathy and every every other member of the same family that's on this uh, session or watching it, none of that will derail your sanity even close to as much as shame or guilt or feeling any of those sort of sensation towards yourself will, okay? Like, please don't do that, <laughs> all right? I mean, you're here. Kathy, the fact that you even had that thought is a huge win. It's a huge, huge win, okay? So lots of stuff there. Hopefully that was helpful. Um, let's see what else we got here. Uh, yes, yeah, salad in a jar. <laughs> All right, Rebecca, yeah, I know uh, some great questions about how to get veggies in on the go, for sure. We got some questions actually written in on that one, so we'll cover that. Uh, ba -ba -dum. Okay, cool beans. All right, so I'm gonna jump into some of the questions that were written in here. So the first question we've got here is, how do you set goals to shift from insane to sane? Add one vegetable per day, cut insane foods one per week. What do I change first? How fast do I go? Hey, that's an awesome question. So thank you very much. That's great. The, the general question here is, how do I work my way into this? How do I set sane goals? Well, let me first answer that by saying what I really don't want you to do. And, and this is after years and years and years of experience and working with thousands and thousands and thousands of people and reading a lot of research. <laughs> yeah. 
So the two things, first is do not set a goal. And I know that this is gonna sound strange, but I'll explain why. I want you, if at all possible, to give yourself permission to set what's called process goals rather than results goals. Let me explain that. With process goal, your goal is exactly what is illustrated in this excellent question here. Like I am going to eat one more serving of vegetables this week than I did last week. And the reason that's an awesome goal is because you can control it as much as you can control anything in life, right? You can control whether or not you eat one more vegetable. You cannot control, no matter how much calorie counters wanna make you think otherwise, right? Oh, eat seven less calories per day and you'll lose exactly this much weight in this much time, which all of us have tried and it's never worked because that's not how your body works. You cannot control how quickly your metabolism heals. You can control how much you stack the deck in the in favor of your metabolism healing, but actually how long it takes your metabolism to heal is unfortunately not up to us, right? If it was totally up to us, I can imagine, hey, you know, you get the flu going back to that immune system analogy. I want to be better tomorrow, but <laughs> unfortunately I can't do that. But what I can do is of course, get some rest. I can, I can eat, uh, you know, drink some tea. I can, I can, I can make sure that I'm taking some vitamin C. I can do all the process steps so that I facilitate that result. But my goal is always on the process. And please, like that, if you didn't do, if you got nothing else from this call or this session, that in and of itself, focusing on process goals rather than results goals is so important. And it's, I mean, that's such ancient wisdom that's not that's not my idea that's that's from long long ago right there's a famous uh quote uh, i'm paraphrasing this from the buddha who says as long as you're facing in the right direction just keep walking and eventually you'll you'll get there uh, obviously i kind of screwed it up a little bit but the point is is that you know just take another step take another step take another step eventually you will get there and so process versus results goals, super important, but what are those process goals? Look, let's keep this really, really simple, really, really simple because it, is, it, it can be simple, right? To focus, I mean, it's, 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 it can be simple. It, it doesn't necessarily mean it's easy, but it can be simpler than it's been made out to be. Vegetable process goal, track, whether it's using the same app, whether it's using the same paper tracker, how many servings of vegetables you ate on average this week? Next week, take it up by one or two. That's that's a epic goal. Another epic process goal. If you're not drinking sane green smoothies, start. Maybe not every day, but if last week you did zero, maybe this week you do one. Next week you do two. And just like write that down. You know, I went from one to two. I went from two to three. And that in and of itself is so encouraging because we're here for the long term, right? If you're on these calls, that means you're here, Saint Ignite, lifetime, right? So those small process steps make such a difference over time. And that's what we want, right? We've all yo-yoed in the show, short term. We want those long-term results. Nutrient-dense protein, same thing. Just think of it in terms of servings. You know, maybe last week you did a great job of getting your nutrient dense proteins in at lunch and dinner but you struggled with breakfast so maybe you say next week i'm going to make sure i get it in at breakfast and just something simple right focus on the food groups what can i do this week in terms of process for my vegetables what can i do this week in terms of what one thing can i do this week in terms of process for my proteins what one thing can i do this week in terms of my whole food fats now what one thing can i do this week to maybe stand and move my body more what one thing can i do this week to get more familiar with eccentric exercise? What one thing can I do this week to, to maybe get a little bit more sleep? What one thing can I do this week to drink a little bit more water or to swap more water and green tea in instead of any sort of insane beverage? But that like, it's hard to put into words how deeply empowering taking on the mindset of small process goals and having that success and sharing that success, like even if it's not perfect, Write that down in the SANE support group in your journal. This week, I'm gonna focus on this one process goal, this one process goal, this one, pro three things, most. 
and let us know how you did. Holy moly, those gradual steps in the, in the three main food groups and then when it comes to movement, I think that in and of itself is gonna be hugely powerful. And then maybe in terms of recipes, like this one, this week, can you find one sane recipe that you enjoy so much that you, it's just something, it's a go-to recipe. And you say, oh my gosh, one recipe in a week, that's nothing, but think about it. If you just keep that up, at the end of a year, one year, right? We're, we're all gonna be here for longer than a year. So there one year, you would have 52 recipes that you've mastered, that you love, that maybe you know your family loves, 52. I mean, how many different recipes do we make over the course of a month today? Imagine if a year from now, you had 52 perfectly sane recipes that you and your family loved. Does that sound crazy? Well, if you found one per week consistently, you've got it. But that's not what we're told to do, right? We're like, oh, do everything right now versus do this one thing consistently. Do that one process thing consistently and holy moly, like the Buddha said, and I butchered, just that's that's facing the right direction. And if you just keep walking, oh my goodness, sane, you will be super sane. You'll be super sane. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see. Here we go. Yay, deleting. I love this. All right. What we got here? Got some good chat coming in here. Thank you so much, Kate. And Rebecca, Kathy, Kate's got some good questions on epigenetics. Yes, Kate, I have done some research on epigenetics. If you have a specific question, please feel free to uh, type it there in the chat box. I'd be happy to help. Uh, will changing my eating help me with Hashimoto's? What's up, Allison? And I love how you spell your name. That is a fantastic way to spell your name. <laughs> uh, yes, it will absolutely help you with Hashimoto's. Uh, anything that is going to increase the nutrient density of your diet and reduce the inflammation that you encourage is going to help with any malady. And we talked about this in the last session, but there is there is no m medical condition. Like, so if you think about disease, um, one way to think of disease is the body not being in its desired state, right? So uh, we have vitamins and minerals and proteins and fats that we call essential, right? Essential amino acids, essential fatty acids, uh, vitamins and minerals are essential. If we don't eat enough of them, we get things like scurvy, rickets, so on and so forth. If you don't eat enough B vitamins, your spinal column deteriorates, not good. Why am I saying these things? Well, disease, is caused by right a breakdown of something in the body. Now, it only makes sense that if we give the body an abundance of that which it needs to thrive and to heal itself, because remember, the only way we ever heal is the body healing itself. That's not like woo-woo mystical crystals. That's science, right? That's Eastern medicine, Western medicine, common sense. The only way disease ever goes away is if the body heals it itself, right? Like that's what putting a bone in a cast does. It allows the body to heal itself. The flu only goes away if the body heals itself. By providing your body with the foods that give it the most of what it needs, and in fact, an abundance of those things, you're not eating less of everything, you're eating more sane things, so much so that you're crowding out the insane things. Any dis-ease of the body will get better. It has to right? We're giving a body more of what it needs to heal itself and less of what causes it to break down in the first place. That's going to help. And that's going to help globally and really, really, really powerfully. And that's why this is so much different than just counting calories and eating less because eating less just gives you less of everything. You don't need less of everything. You need more of good things so much so that you're too full for the insane nonsense. So hopefully that's really helpful. Uh, why is whole wheat bad for us? Great question. So let's keep in mind here that whenever we're talking about food, um, food is a zero sum game. So what I mean by that, it's kind of an economic term, is when we eat one thing, we're not eating another thing, which I know <laughs> sounds a little bit stupid, but it's actually important to think about, right? So if we put a bunch of whole grains on our plate, by definition, we are not putting something else on our plate. So it's it's taking up space. Now, when it comes to is something good for us or is something healthy or is something sane, th that's really 
like, as you know, we have the spectrum, right? We got non-starchy vegetables on one end of the spectrum. We have liquid sugar on the other end of the spectrum. Whenever we say is something good or bad for us, what we're really asking is like, is this better than that? Or is this better than everything else I could be eating right now? So for example, is whole wheat bad for us relative to sugar? No, actually, absolutely not. And in fact, the reason that we have heard that whole grains are good for us is because they are better for us than refined grains. If you had to choose between eating Wonder Bread and eating bread that was made from einkorn wheat, which is uh, einkorn and emmer wheat is the wheat that is, existed in biblical times versus the dwarf mutant wheat that we have today, which is a totally different species of wheat. It's got like 42 chromosomes, whereas uh, the wheat of biblical times was back in the teens. Like I think it had 12 or 14 chrom chromosomes, totally different. It's a totally different plant. It's literally like apples and oranges. So emmer wheat compared to dwarf mutant wheat, totally different thing. So if we're eating whole wheat, even dwarf wheat, instead of eating sugar, that's a good choice. That's better for us. Much like eating, uh, smoking one pack of cigarettes per day is better for us than smoking two. But the key thing to keep in mind is just like smoking one pack of cigarettes per day versus smoking two, uh, doesn't make smoking one pack of cigarettes just objectively good for us, especially when we could be breathing in even cleaner air. So let's go back to the whole grains. What people, a lot of people use whole grains for is to fill themselves up. So often what happens is whole grains are used to crowd out vegetables. So they're just like rolls or filler or rice. I mean, they're usually just things to fill you up. Now, when it comes to filling ourselves up, we now know, oh my goodness, from a hormonal healing perspective and just from a satisfaction perspective and a health and a fat loss perspective, whole food fats, they are so satisfying and they're so hormonally healthy for us. And they also don't contain any sort of inflammatory substances. Like for example, there is um, like amylopectin A is a very addictive substance that's found in whole wheat. Uh, whole grains can cause gut permeability issues because they have uh, uh, a lot of various substances that can irritate gut bacteria. This is why you hear so much about celiac disease. This is why you hear so much about a gluten intolerance. There's just a lot of things in whole grains that are not nearly as beneficial for us as some of the other foods can we that we can be eating. So it's not like, oh my gosh, the reason we have an obesity epidemic is because people are eating whole grains. No, no, I mean, that's that's not the reason we have an obesity epidemic, but the reason whole grains are not considered sane, in addition to being relatively low uh, satiety and low in nutrition and, and aggression and the, the factors that contribute to sanity, it's just because man, I'd so much rather you're eating your vegetables. And, and, I, and I actually, I had a, um, uh, I interviewed one of the, the uh, someone who used to be the head. Sh sh she was the speaker, the public face for the, like the National Dietetic Association or something, some big organization. And I just asked her, I asked her point blank, you know, if you had, if a person had, was eating whole grains in place of vegetables, would you recommend that? And of course not, right? There's nothing that is unique about whole grains that we can't get in greater abundance in vegetables and low sugar fruits, as well as without all the like gluten and other stuff. Like there's no amylopectin A or gluten in, in kale. So whole grains, it's not like, ah, oh, whole grains. Ah! <laughs> it's just that whole grains uh, do do some damaging things to quite a few people. They can stimulate appetite. They can cause a lot of insulin to get released in your body, which can contribute to prediabetes. They can make you hungrier rather than satisfying you. And, but most importantly, Often they're preventing you from eating saner foods. And I want you to eat so much of the good stuff that you're just too full for things that are less sane. So hopefully that is helpful. All right, let's see here. Let me catch up here on a little bit of the chat. All right, good stuff. Oh goodness, now there's lots of chat. Julie and Fran and Allison. Julie, I haven't seen you on chat before. Welcome, Julie is, is not being shy, I like that. All right, um, let's go. Tummy problems, remember you sure gluten, don't let anything insane, never felt so great. Oh, thank you so much, Fran. That's good stuff. Fran, Fran is just, just dropping positivity in here. I love it. I love it. Uh, salt, Allison, do we need to limit salt? Because to me, that's what makes veggies taste good. Good news. Salt has been given a bad rap. So here's the situation with salt. 
the reason salt has been given, when you think salt, you probably don't think super healthy. <laughs> I don't know what you think, but you probably don't think super healthy. Uh, the bottom line is that salt is definitely an issue when you're eating insane foods. When you're eating insane foods, what you'll find is that the amount of salt in processed food, right? Salt is a preservative. So when you when you take soy and corn and wheat and and other uh, processed monocrops, and you strip out all the nutrients, you got to make them taste like something because <laughs> you know what? Soy by itself with everything stripped away just does not taste good. Neither does wheat, neither does corn, right? You got you to gotta do something with it. What can you do with it to give it a really stable shelf life and to make it taste good for very little money? You pump it full of trans fats because trans fats stay shelf stable. You pump it full of a huge amount of salt and you pump it full of sugar, right? If you read, um, what's the guy's name? I forget his name, but the title of the book uh, is Fat, Sugar, Salt right? And talking about the three major weapons of the processed food industry. And of course, we all know that it's not that like fat is bad. It's fat. The fat found in processed food is bad. Same thing with salt, right? Salt, when used like we would normally use it, is not going to be bad. The way you would naturally and normally use salt, not bad. But when we put our trust and our, our, our health, frankly, and our lives in the hands of companies whose only interest they're not evil right it's not they're not evil but nestle's job right people who own stock in nestle are not interested in the blood pressure of other people they're interested in making money that's they're a business right that's not evil right we all have jobs and we're all able to use computers because businesses exist. So, so nothing wrong with business. It's just that we have to understand that processed food manufacturers are not in the business of our health. They're in the business of making food that costs them very little to sell, that they can charge a lot for, and that tastes good. Adding a heck of a lot of salt, adding a heck of a lot of sugar, and adding a heck of a lot of unnatural fats causes that, and it kills us. So just like everything else, if you do it the way nature intended it, right? It's all good. It's all good. So yes, if you are just sprinkling some, some sea salt, or my favorite is the pink Himalayan salt that has a wonderful flavor to it. It's got some essential minerals in it. That's a great way to, to help with the veggies. And as a general rule of thumb, anything within reason, within reason that, that you can do to get yourself and your family to eat more vegetables, boom, it's worth it, right? So you know, I, I bacon is not particularly sane uh, to just eat strips and strips of bacon, but to use bacon as a seasoning for vegetables, do it, do it. Whatever you can do to get that nutrition into your body, do it. Salt has been given an overly bad rap in general, number one. Number two, you will not overdo it with salt if you do not consume insane processed foods because you would never, just like, for example, right, soda has... 11 to 15 teaspoons of sugar in 12 ounces, which is ridiculous, right? If you were going to make yourself a beverage, even if you were going to sweeten it, you would never sit there for yourself or for someone you love and say, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to make, I'm going to make my five-year-old a beverage here. Here, let me get some sugar. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. You would never do that ever, <laughs> but food manufacturers will. So as long as we stay away from the process nonsense, we'll be all right in terms of that.